All right, I think we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to today's compliance webinar. The focus of today's presentation is compliance within a value-based healthcare organization and sponsored by the American Institute of Healthcare Compliance. My name's Joanne Byron and I'm with the American Institute. Before I introduce our speaker, let's review some disclaimer information. The information presented today, none of this is intended as legal or consulting advice. The circumstances surrounding your specific organization is unique and really requires retaining a professional familiar with your organization and compliance issues that your organization faces. Our speaker requests holding questions for the Q&A at the end. I'm proud to introduce Shereen Honest, Principal at the Honest Approach Consulting Firm and Vice President of Astrana Health. Shereen, over to you. Thank you so much, Joanne. I appreciate the introduction. I'm going to go ahead, everyone, and turn my camera off while I'm presenting, but I will definitely come back on for our Q&A session um, uh, so that I can and speak with you then as well. Now, looking at the agenda, these are the areas that we'll be touching on during the presentation. Please keep in mind the presentation is, is a high-level overview of some of the areas of compliance within the value-based healthcare organization. There are many different models within value-based care. Everyone is attempting to find that secret sauce where payment and quality of care are equitable. There's value-based care offered by private payers, whom I'll refer to as commercial plans. And then you have value-based care offered by Medicare, which is your Medicare Advantage or Part C plan. To determine what a commercial payer requires from a compliance perspective, you want to start by reviewing your payer contract. Identify the areas that are compliance related. And in many instances, commercial plans will follow Medicare or other federal government compliance standards. But just be aware, the commercial plans may develop their own requirements that you will have to follow from a compliance perspective. Ideally, from an operational perspective, you only want to have one set of compliance guidelines that your organization has to follow. You have to follow the most stringent requirements that are uh, that you're responsible for, whether it's from the commercial plan or Medicare Advantage. No one's going to care if you're doing more than what they require, but they'll certainly care if you do less. So keep in mind um, all of your stakeholders when you're developing your policies and procedures and your compliance guidelines. In November of 2023, the OIG released their new General Compliance Program Guidance, the GCPG. Now, the first set of guidance was released back in 1998, and over the years, they've released 11 different sets of guidance that cover different industries within healthcare, such as hospitals, provider offices, laboratories, and skilled nursing facilities. The new guidance is meant to help all types of healthcare organizations develop an overarching compliance program and encourage voluntary compliance efforts. The main goal is to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse within the healthcare industry. To discuss a little bit about fraud, so to commit fraud requires intent. It means you intend to obtain payment for services where you know what you're doing is wrong. This could be, for example, billing for appointments where you know that the patient never came in for that particular appointment. Waste can be overutilizing services, such as ordering testing that's really not required or needed. And abuse, abuse results in unnecessary program costs. This can be upcoding of a service. So for example, a physician may provide and document a level of service that's lower than what they bill for the insurance company for. So such as documenting a level three evaluation and management visit, but billing for a level four visit instead. The quote unquote, big four federal fraud and abuse laws are listed here. Now I've borrowed these descriptions from a healthcare attorney friend of mine, because I feel that they give a quick snapshot of what the law intends. The anti-kickback statute or AKS is a, is a criminal violation. It says, thou shall not pay for referrals. The AKS states that no one can pay for or receive remuneration 
from referring patients in a federal healthcare program, such as Medicare. Now, remuneration can be cash or cash in kind. So for example, it could be an all expense paid vacation, concert tickets, or anything else of value in order to receive patient referrals. The next one, the Stark Law or the Physician Self-Referral Law is a civil violation and states, thou shall not refer to certain entities. Healthcare providers may not refer their Medicare patients to entities that provide designated health services, such as clinical labs, uh, physical therapy, occupational te therapy, where the physician or immediate family member of the physician has a financial interest in that particular entity. There's a list of 12 de designated health services that you can locate on cms.gov. There are specific exceptions where the Stark, Stark Law is not triggered and where the financial relationship between the physician and that entity doesn't pose a risk of abuse of the Medicare program or patient abuse. Uh, you can seek legal advice if you want to further examine those exceptions to the Stark Law. The False Claims Act is just what it sounds like. Uh, thou shall not submit false claims. You can't knowingly submit a false claim for payment where you know that a service was not actually performed, but you still build it out, for example. You can't knowingly make a false record to support a fraudulent claim where the claim is paid by the government and you cannot knowingly make a false statement in order to conceal, avoid, or decrease an obligation to pay the government. The last of the big four are civil monetary penalties. Some of the areas in civil monetary, civil monetary penalties can be assessed by the OIG include violations of the False Claims Act, the anti-kickback statute, or for contracting or employing someone who's been excluded from participating in a federal health care program. So the civil monetary penalties are additional monetary payments in lieu of damages sustained by the government because of the improper uh, claims that were submitted to them. So when we say thou shall pay a lot of money for violations, it really is a true statement. In addition to paying the government for the loss, um, for example, being fined three times the damages the government incurred for fa a false claim, there can also be additional penalties assessed through civil monetary penalties. So then you think about what about the state laws, right? There are many of the state laws, who, states that have similar laws to these big four federal laws. It really depends on the state and you'll wanna always make sure that you check the state laws and you follow the stricter of them, whether it's the state law or the federal law, you wanna follow the stricter uh, regulation or law that's out there. And when developing an effective compliance plan, you want to tailor it to the organization's risk areas related to those state and federal laws um, that you have to follow. So the next question might be, you know, what makes an effective compliance program? The answer is it, it really depends. It depends on the size and scope of the organization. You have to look at the types of services that are provided and how large or, again, small the organization is. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to compliance, and it's not meant to be a one-size-fits-all situation. To guide us in developing an effective compliance plan are these seven elements. Each element has many areas that should be explored by each organization. Now, we could talk for days if we tried to cover each element in detail. So with the limited time that we have today, I'm going to highlight a couple of areas for each of the elements that organizations can look into further. Here's a list of common policies within each of the seven elements. I'm not gonna read this slide to you, but I'll cover some of these items as we continue through the presentation. Element one is written policies and procedures, which are meant to guide your organization on standards and requirements that are expected from relevant individuals of the organizations. Now, relevant individuals are, in general, people who work for or do work on behalf of the organization. This can be employees, contractors, or vendors. The written policies and procedure can be organizational-wide, like your code of conduct and compliance plan, which describe the mission, vision, values, and ethical behavior of those representing the organization. They cover federal and state laws and regulations, or can be role or department-specific policies. 
The policies and procedures should be accessible to the relevant individuals of the organization. They can be accessible on the comp company's internet, website, in a policy management system, or even on paper. And when practicable, they should be made accessible before they're actually implemented, because this gives the individuals time to review and understand what they'll be responsible for based on that policy. And whether the, whether the policies are organizational wide or department and role specific ones, having one repository where the policies and procedures are housed and maintained by the policy owner is really an ideal scenario. I quickly found that it is very difficult to manage policy content and versions when the policy is kept on an individual's computer. And sometimes it becomes a phishing expedition to find the most recent document, especially when the policy owner exits the organization. And when it comes to audits, whether it's internal or external audits by the government or a health plan, it's expected that you track and document when policies are distributed and reviewed by individuals. Auditors will want evidence that the policies, policies have been reviewed and implemented, and typically policies are reviewed and, and when the employee is initially hired, and then annually or more frequently if there's a change that's been made to the policy. You also want to test understanding. Does the staff understand the written policy? Is it written at an appropriate reading level, which is usually no more than a 10th grade reading level? It should be written in plain language so that it can be understood by all. And you may also want to consider language translation to the policy if you have a large number of individuals where English is not their first language. Next, it's necessary that individuals know how to contact your compliance officials in the organization. The compliance officer and compliance committee should be available to answer questions related to a policy. This is important not only in managing the accuracy of the policy itself, but also it helps to identi identify potential risks. The more questions that employees ask, the better. This gives you the opportunity to update, correct, and provide education to the staff. If one person has a question, you can be guaranteed that more than one person has that same exact question. And finally, policies should be reviewed, updated, maintained, and distributed, at least on an annual basis, and more frequently based on changes that are made to either the federal state requirements or changes within the organizational risks themselves. This is a list of common organizational-wide policies and procedures. Again, they should be based on size and structure of the organization. They can be individual policies or incorporated into an overarching policy. So for example, small, small organizations may not need a separate conflict of interest and gift and gratuities policy. Those can potentially be incorporated into, let's say, the compliance plan. Now, we've already touched base on the code of conduct and, and compliance plan, but another important policy for healthcare organizations is to have a HIPAA and privacy, privacy and security policy in place, which sets the standards on how patients' protected health information, or PHI, is handled, maintained, and protected, while at the same time allowing appropriate use and disclosure of that information so that patients can receive timely and quality care. Element two is leadership oversight which sets and reinforces the culture of ethics and compliance throughout the organization. This should be demonstrated by the company's top leaders. Auditors look not only to have those words on a page in a policy, but they wanna see them in action. They want to see them followed and demonstrated um, throughout the organization. And prior to the new compliance guidance from the OIG, compliance oversight was really with the compliance officer. Now, the oversight is no longer just with that one person. The new guidance provides clarification and emphasis that the board and the compliance committee are also accountable for a well-run compliance program. They want to be able to see an active compliance committee who are comprised of department leaders who support the compliance officer in implementing, operating, and monitoring the compliance program. And there continues to be a stress on having the compliance function being adequately, adequately resourced and budgeted. Now, each organization, depending on its scope and size, needs to determine how they will resource and budget the compliance department. 
small organizations may have one person responsible for the compliance function and also perform other duties. Larger organizations may have multiple people within the compliance department. One thing um, the OIG does recommend is separation of duties. So when the compliance function is not performed by, for example, someone involved in delivery of healthcare services or revenue cycle functions, such as coding, billing, and, or claims, the OIG recommends that the compliance function and those types of uh, other functions be separate and, and fall under separate people. Element three is training and education, which should be based on the organization's uh, compliance risks. For example, risks could be coding and documentation for a healthcare provider, data security for a clearinghouse, and we've recently seen this with the change healthcare incident, or for health plans, it could be the risk in sales and marketing practices. Training and education should cover the federal and state requirements pertinent to your organization, and we touch base on those big four laws, the anti-kickback, stark, false claim, and civil monetary penalties. Training should include a description of the laws and how the organization could be at risk if there are violations to the laws. It's also important to have targeted training based on the position and role an, indiv an individual has within the organization. For example, there could be board training, provider training, and billing and coding and documentation training. Additionally, training should be accessible to culturally diverse staff. So for example, it, it can be made available in different languages if necessary, and it can be provided in different formats. It could be in person, virtually, pre-recorded, or computer-based training. Element four, effective communication, includes having open access to the compliance officer, ideally through an open door policy. Individuals should know how to contact the compliance officer. Information should be posted in areas frequented by staff and should describe how to contact the, com the compliance officer, whether it's in person, on the phone, through emails, through a compliance portal. Building trust within the organization where people feel safe to share concerns is critical. Individuals should understand that the information they share will remain confidential unless there is a requirement that it has to be shared. If an individual reports a concern in good faith, they should be made to understand that retaliation based on that report will not be tolerated. In order to continue building that trust, the organization should provide multiple ways for concerns to be reported. And this can be reporting directly to a federal and state agency or within the organization through anonymous reporting methods such as a hotline or a compliance portal. Element five, enforcing standards, will describe how long the organization, excuse me, describes how the organization handles the actions that don't adhere to policies and procedures, standards, or law. It'll describe what steps are taken in an investigation and what are potential remediation actions that could be issued. Consequences of noncompliance are based on the severity of the incident. It could lead to education and retraining, non-punitive action, or could be as severe as termination or prosecution for criminal acts. Incentives for compliance should also be developed by the compliance committee and the compliance officer. The incentives should encourage individuals to actively follow and support the compliance program. Now, possible ways to incentivize can be through recognition, be monetary, or, or some other small gesture. In the past, I created a, an annual training competition across all the markets and departments of the organization I was in. The idea was to get all of the annual training completed by the end of the year. So all areas who completed their training by the deadline had their name placed in a hat. Then we selected three areas from that hat and they received a catered lunch. And, and all I can say is people love a little competition and they love their food. So it was definitely an effective incentive of getting large areas to complete the annual training. Element six, auditing and monitoring, will describe the reporting system available within the organization. Now, how can concerns be reported? 
Now, it can be done directly to a, a compliance official. It could be anonymous. It could be through a compliance portal or even a Dropbox where individuals can leave a note with their concerns. This policy will describe how a risk assessment is conducted, and then it should be done at least annually, and then it should identify and prioritize top risks of the organization. Once the risks are identified, the next step is to develop a work plan to audit and monitor the risks. For example, you can start by creating an audit schedule, which indicates the areas that need to be audited and at what frequency. So for example, you could have an area that's audited monthly, quarterly, annually. The audit process itself will identify the scope of the audit, who will participate in the audit, what data will be collected and analytics assessed, and it'll analyze gaps that are identified. And once the audit is actually completed, you'll need to determine whether ongoing monitoring is necessary. You'll want to adjust the timing and frequency of the monitoring if needed and issue a corrective action plan as appropriate. And that corrective action plan or CAP will identify deficiencies. It'll request a root cause analysis be conducted. It will ask for a target date for the remediation to be completed. And it'll ask you to list the person responsible for that CAP to be completed. Element seven is responding to offenses. Offenses can be detected multiple ways. We've talked about it through audits, anonymous reporting, could be a patient complaint. Once an issue has been identified and it is determined that an investigation is needed, you wanna interview individuals who are involved in and or knowledgeable about the situation. You wanna review documents and data related to the issue and determine the impact and extent of the offense. Is the impact significant? Do you need to coordinate with your legal counsel? Or is the offense reportable to the government? Does it violate one of those laws that we talked about, the big four, the AKS, Stark Law, False Claims, Civil Monetary Penalties? Or are there patient safety concerns? The bottom line is the OIG wants to see prompt reporting and the use of the voluntary self-disclosure program when it's appropriate. This sends a clear message to the organization um, that the organization's operating at a, at a high level of ethical and compliance standards. So what changed with the new guidance that was issued in November of 2023? In general, the compliance program guidance hasn't changed a lot, it pro but it does provide more clarity and emphasis on certain areas, like the shared responsibility and accountability of the compliance officer and the compliance committee and the board, However, there are a few areas um, addressed in the guidelines that are new, areas the OIG will definitely delve into further in the future. The guidance provides clarification on quality and patient safety. The OIG feels that compliance should have some kind of oversight of quality and patient safety. We've seen the OIG and the DOJ get be involved in cases where substandard care resulted in death or harm to a patient. Now, these may have been propagated by false claims being submitted, excessive services provided, or other false claims or related issues. Another area discussed in the new guidance are new entrants in health, into the healthcare industry. For example, technology companies who support healthcare providers with applications and data analytics. Uh, you have private equity companies who may be not familiar with the healthcare landscape and regulatory requirements that are out there. Or you may have existing healthcare companies who expand into a new line of uh, business, a new service line. At the beginning of the year, I was invited by the OIG to participate in a Medicare Advantage focus group. One of the areas that they focused on during our discussions were the new entrants into healthcare space. We can are definitely guaranteed to see updated industry-specific guidance with emphasis on these new entrants sometime in the future. There's also a section with guidance on small and large entities. The requirements are similar in expectation, but they do acknowledge the different resource capabilities between small organizations and large organizations. And finally, the there are OIG resources outlined throughout the new guidance. Now to realize that full value of those resources, please review the guidance document online. There is a plethora of resources listed throughout the document with hyperlinks to other sites and guidance that are incredibly valuable.
We've talked about the general compliance program guidance, the GCPG. Now here's a list of all the other industry specific guidance that has been um, released between 1998 and 2008. As I mentioned before, there are 11 different industry specific guidance and the OIG has promised that the first two new guidance, industry specific guidance that we released this year in 2024 will be updates on Medicare Advantage and the skilled nursing facilities. So keep your eyes peeled out for that because that'll be um, very important information that's going to be coming out on Medicare Advantage. Now, if you want to find out more about the new guidance and compliance requirements, I want to remind everyone that AIHC does have the Corporate Compliance Officer Certification Training Program that you can look into. Also on this slide are hyperlinks to both the new guidance and the current industry-specific guidance that you can take a look at for those 11 that are out there listed. So a compliance program is not required by the government. It is a, it's a voluntary uh, to have one in place. So why do you need a compliance program? It is to ensure compliant and ethical behavior of all individuals within the organization and those who are doing work on behalf of the organization. It's to identify and manage risks. So for example, you wanna minimize billing mistakes and avoid overpayment, increase accuracy in your documentation, reduce chances, chances of an audit. You wanna avoid conflicts with the self-referral law and anti-kickback statute, mitigate fines, penalties, exclusions, corrective action plans, and even corporate integrity agreements. And many times, a compliance program is required in the Medicare Advantage value-based care health plan contracts. So you'll definitely want to review your contracts um, and determine what the requirements are. So who's involved in a compliance program? As we've mentioned before, it's your compliance committee, your compliance officer, the board of directors, and it's all relevant members who are included, as I mentioned, your employees, you have contractors, you have vendors, business associates, physicians, providers, uh, your first year downstream and related entities. And we're going to touch base on the business associates and your FDRs um, in the next couple of slides. Business associate is a person or organization who does work on behalf of a covered entity and who perform functions that involve the use and disclosure of protected health information. Now, covered entity includes health plans, healthcare providers, and clearinghouses. Business associates can include your legal, your consultants, coding vendors, anyone touching PHI that's not employed by that healthcare organization in general. And when do you need a business associate agreement? When's it required? It's when that covered entity engages that business associate. So, for example, when a healthcare provider brings in a consultant um, who's going to be having access to the PHI within the clinic, you'll definitely want to have a business associate agreement between that consultant and the, the clinic provider, the clinic and healthcare provider. I took this slide from the CM, CMS MLN web-based training, and it gives you kind of a, a, just a high-level picture view of what a first-year downstream and related entities or FDRs are. And the best way I can I keep it in my head and I describe it is you have CMS. They then contract with private payers, your Part C plan sponsors. So, for example, um, you know some of the bigger ones are you have your Blue Cross Blue Shield or Anthem who are a part of the Medicare Advantage Part C plans. Uh, you have Centene, you have your Optums, you have many different organizations that are out there that are your Part C um, private, quote unquote, pri private payers whom CMS is contracted with. Now that Part C plan sponsor can then contract with other entities, could be provider offices, um, you know, it could be other fulfillment vendors that are out there. When they contract and delegate functions, then that next level is the first tier um, of the FDR. And if, let's say, that independent practice, that provider then um, 
hires contracts with a provider or a consultant, they are downstream of CMS, of that plan sponsor, and of that first tier entity. So that's your downstream um, level. Here are a few examples under each one. So you could have under your first year, you could have your pharmacy benefit administrator. You could have an adjudication company, a company that handles enrollment. For downstream, it could be a doctor's office or firms that are providing agent or broker services. There are many different ways to define that. And related entities are entities with common ownership or control by the sponsor, a healthcare promotion provider, or for example, um, silver sneakers are related entities to your plan sponsors. And just a quick view of some of the training requirements um, for your Medicare Advantage value-based care area. One, you have to have your seven elements of a compliance plan um, defined and in policies and procedures. You wanna have compliance training, which is required and must happen within 90 days of initial hire and at least annually thereafter. And every organization involved in Medicare Advantage must have a code of conduct, fraud, waste, and abuse policy, and compliance plan. You want to have proof of training, such as sign-in sheets, employee attestations, electronic certifications, that people have gone through the compliance training, gone through whatever other uh, policies and procedures that are required. And at the bottom of this slide, there are links to the MLN web-based training. And there's also a link for the fraud, waste, abuse training for organizations who participate in Part C and D. And I know we, we ended very quickly. Um, we're, we're at the questions portion of our presentation. So I'm hoping that everyone has at least one or two questions um, out there that we can uh, go through and discuss. Okay, Shereen. Yeah, we do have one really important question. And um, this is from Rose Dunn. How does com the compliance plan guidance that you reviewed today and the requirements different from, how does it differ from an organization that is not value-based? Um, what she's asking is that everything that you covered is what the OIG expects from all healthcare providers. So what's different about value-based organizations? If you can explain more about value-based organizations and how what you presented is different from other organizations requirements. Sure. So the general compliance guidance, yes, is um, can be utilized by all organizations, whether they're in value-based care or not. When you're in value-based care, you really do have to um, look at what your health plan or the plan sponsor is requiring. And it depends on what you're contracting with to do work on behalf of that plan sponsor that's going to um, you know, put the other pieces in place for your value-based care um, requirements. So for example, if you're a, um, an MSO and you conduct delegated functions, so let's say you have um, a, a network of providers that you contract with and you have to manage those providers and make sure that they are also following compliance guidelines. So they have to go through training and education they have to go through the False Claims Act, um, fraud, waste, and abuse uh, training and education. And you as that MSO who's doing work on behalf of that Plan C sponsor, contracted to do Medicare Advantage, have to monitor and make sure that anyone you contract with, in this, this example, let's say a network provider, are also completing all those requirements for training and education, um, and you you have you're responsible for conducting audits on behalf of that um, Part C plan to the provider. It could be um, you know if you're processing claims on behalf and you're delegated to process claims on behalf of that plan sponsor. There are um, certain guidelines and requirements from a compliance perspective, a turnaround time of 
having those claims processed in a timely manner, or if you're processing payments and you're responsible for processing payments for um, that particular plan sponsor, there are turnaround times for payments to be sent in a timely manner to providers. So there are very specific requirements from a, a Medicare Advantage value-based care. It, it's really going to depend on that contract that you have with that plan sponsor, or that health plan, or commercial plan. I hope I answered that question. I'm happy to, to delve in more if there's more onto that. Okay. Um... We do have another question, but before we move on, because it's a very good question, um, I did want to just expound on some of my experience, if I can add in, Shereen. Um, I have done as a consultant before, uh, gone into a practice that was told that if they did not comply uh, to improving some of their quality standards and their compliance policies and procedures, they were going to lose a whole sector of uh, insurance plans. They did not have a written OSHA plan. They had a moderately complex lab. They did not calibrate their equipment. They didn't have anything standard up to the CLIA standards to make sure that when lab tests were done, that the lab tests were reliable. Uh, they walked through the entire practice and just came up with a checklist of all these violations where they did not have, they weren't practicing what they were preaching, or they didn't have anything documented to show that they were, had ongoing proof of quality standards. And in a value-based organization, you've got to show that you do have quality built into your day-to-day -day operations. Otherwise, you, I mean, they had time and we brought them up to speed within three, the three month deadline. So they didn't lose like three fourths of their patient base, but that's what can happen. It can financially devastate somebody. Okay, next question. This is from Pike PC. That's how they logged in. If I want to employ my spouse in the same business as a PT, I'm assuming that's physical therapist in a chiropractic business, how can that be possible without breaching any posted rules or laws? So the first thing I will say is you will probably want to go and seek legal advice from a healthcare uh, attorney. Uh, I, I can't necessarily give you the details behind that because it is really specific to your practice and what you already do. Uh, so my, my best advice on that is you do seek legal counsel um, to, to get that answer. I apologize, I can't give you more details on that, but but a healthcare attorney will definitely be able to, to guide you. Okay, next question. Uh, Shreen, can you talk about FDR attestation hospitals should be obtaining? Sure. Um, the FDR attestation you have to have um, in place because, again, your plan sponsor is going to, to require it. And there are going to be certain questions that are asked um, because they want to make sure that you are maintaining um, your set of FDRs. So I'm going to just give a for example. Um, you know, one of the things that I had to attest for as a compliance officer um, was, do we have anyone working offshore? And if they're working offshore, what are the, the pieces of PHI, if they have access to PHI? I mean, we'd have to go through a, a whole analysis, um, but they want to make sure that your FDRs are following the rules and the guidance and the requirements um, that they're putting forward. So as I mentioned, you know, you have CMS, then you have your plan sponsor, then you have your first tier, um, which, for example, could be the hospital or provider organization. And if they are contracting with anyone, you'll want you'll need to have the plan usually gives you a, a template uh, attestation that tells you fill that out and you say, OK, these are the, the people who are contracted and we have uh, analyzed them and we're testing that they follow the rules and regulations. We've audited them. Uh, we've looked at their uh, their structure. We've looked at what their security posture is, you know, do they have security in place to keep 
are PHI um, secure. So those are some of the things. And so it's a, typically a, a templated form that the health plan will give to you um, that you'll need to fill out and then attest that, you know, what you're putting on there is true and a fact. And they, you'll want to have definitely your evidence that you've gone and, you know, whatever you're attesting to is there and available because the health plan can definitely come back and ask you to provide that evidence or they'll just automatically ask you to, to send that in along with that attestation. Okay. And an extension of that question, Shereen, what department would be the most appropriate and to obtain those FDR attestations? Payer relations, contracting, um, this uh, organization is having a hard time finding these. Sure. You know, it, it, again, it's going to depend on the organization. It could be done in a couple of different ways that I've seen. Um, you know, the compliance department could be responsible for obtaining that the FDR attestation or the department that is doing the work. So for example, you know, if, um, I'll use claims as an example. If your claims department um, has brought on different contractors um, and let's say it's somebody that's offshore and they they are responsible for that particular contract they have that relationship with that particular vendor they may need to then obtain information from that vendor in order to complete that fdr attestation uh, you what you'll want to do is probably have claims and compliance work together to get the documents and then the different information uh, secured so I, we've done it in, in a couple of different ways where compliance is responsible because ultimately the health plan wants compliance to be involved um, in, in all of the F attestations and, and that information. But you may need to partner with that department specific um, leader in order to actually get the information that you need. Thank you. All right, we have another question. Uh, Shereen, can you compare or contrast the compliance officer, the security officer, and the privacy officer. And before you answer, I just want to let you know that of about the 32,000 members that we have and affiliates with the American Institute, we are finding more and more people with a title of compliance slash HIPAA officer or compliance slash privacy officer wearing many hats in fairly large organizations, but if you can compare and contrast between those three positions. Absolutely. Um, and, and Joanne, you bring up a, a great point. Um, in one of the organizations I was in, I was, yes, both the compliance officer and, and the privacy officer. So I, I did wear dual hats with that. Um, so the compliance side is what we in general spoke about today, right? You have your seven elements of a compliance program and plan and having all the pieces and parts of those, that seven elements together. You work very closely also with your privacy official. Um, the privacy official is there to, you know, use and look at use and disclosure. Are there breaches? But again, it's you work closely with your compliance person who has, um, you know, your your the compliance plan, um, the training and education, the policies and procedures that we talked about with leadership and oversight and and your um, open lines of communication. Right. So those are the different functions or features, usually managed by your compliance officer. It, it is really your your PHI, your PII, uh, personal information and how things are managed with that, that the privacy officer, the uses and disclosures, uh, potential breaches that your privacy officer uh, manages. So things related to PHI and PII. Your security officer, and um, and just one, one quick note, all three of those hats work very, very closely together. Um, you know, I, I work very closely with the security officer and the security information security department because they're the ones who helped manage that PHI in transit. You know, how secure was that information? How did we, you know, hold that information securely in our sites? How do we transmit that information if we had a vendor who was going to do work on our behalf? Um, you know, we had security analysis of the particular vendor's um, 
uh, security posture. So your IT, IS security function, they manage the security side of, um, of HIPAA. And it's also, that also includes, you know, your physical location and how secure is that physical location. It's the data. It's, you know, if you have a data warehouse, how secure is that data warehouse? So it really um, talks about that data that you have and how you're going to protect that PHI from a breach or cyber incident. Uh, that, that's probably just a, a very high level uh, description of, of the security officer and their function. But I work very, very closely when I was the security, excuse me, when I was the compliance and privacy officer, I worked very, very closely. I would say probably 60% of my day were in collaboration with the security function um, and to just because compliance, privacy, and security are working constantly hand in hand because it's all about keeping that patient information secure. And making sure that you know there's there are no compliance issues or breach issues or security or cyber security issues because it all is impacting that patient that we see. I hope that answers that question. Anything else, Shreen, that you wanted to go over with everyone? Uh, you know, I think it from a presentation standpoint that was it. But I would definitely recommend everyone to uh, to take a look at the corporate compliance uh, course that you have available through AHC. Um, I think that'd be a great resource to also learn more for, um, for a compliance perspective. So mm -hmm. that'd be it. Okay. And thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shereen, for sharing your expertise with us. It was very, very interesting. Thank you so much.